one that made the team, our captain, was Henry Lander. And, uh, my, my name is Mervyn Green, and I made assistant captain. And my two bowmen was Henry's son, David Lander, and he made the team. And the other guy was an Air Force, uh, an Air Army guy from Camp Gatestown, and his name is Jerry, Jerry Dugwood. He was originally from uh, Quebec. And he was fluent in French, but he's English, but he's fluent in French. He was brought up in the French school. And Gordy Green, he was in Newfoundland. And Ken Murray was, he was a weightlifter, and he, he was a strong kid. And he was in St. John. And uh, he could, he, I see him lay on his back and press 600 pounds with his legs, just up, up and down, nothing to it. <laughs> and he'd come across Canada, he went, he went into a, a packing contest, and he beat the carrier, the top carrier. He was over in this carrier. He brought dope because he didn't want to rinse his back or anything. So, but uh, he was yes, Ken Murray he was the top head guy. And then another guy on the the team was Fred Susi. He was up Quebec way, the northern part of the province, again not Quebec, but uh, Edmonton way. And uh, Don Downing was from Fredericton. He was a university guy. He was one of the youngest guy on our on our team, and I was uh, I turned so I was 33. So I was wow. I won. Henry was at wow. that time. He he was he turned 40 uh, 50 on his trip. He was 49. So wow. And uh, and who else is on the team? In a way, oh yeah, so the university guy uh, Tom Pinkard. He was he would never try. He was never at any of trial, but he was top one of the top guys in the university in sports. Mm -hmm. Someone told me that talking to some of one of the older guys said, "You know, use not paddles, so you get a lot of blisters on your hands." He said, uh, "Too bad you couldn't get a hose in Boston, or Peru." I said, "Boston, Peru," and then I heard talk fire Boston, but I never heard of Boston, Peru. Oh yeah, he said, "They used that a lot in the First World War." I said, really? Oh, yes. He said, men with feet, gauntlet feet, and blisters and stuff, and never had a change of socks, and said, and uh, sores on their legs, and all oh, this great stuff. And I can't remember who told me that. That's why I slipped my mind. But one day I was in Fredericton, and I go and buy Ross drugs, and old Mr. Ross was still working there then. It was the old fellow that was running the drugstore, and I went in and asked to see old Mr. Ross. So he come over, what can I help you with you, sir? And I said, you wouldn't have to have some old boss in Peru. And he just leaned over the counter and looked at me. He said, where you were? He looked, he knew my age. I wasn't in the First World War. He said, where are you ever here to tell that? And I told him. He said, well, he said, look, I, I, I can't recall when the, the last time I was asked for boss or Peru in this drugstore. But he said, then, I have a little odds and ends down in the basement. He said, I'll have a look. You come in in a week's time, and I'll have a look and see if I got any. I told him what I wanted for him, but this canoe rate. He never heard tell, didn't even seem to know me what this rate. So I went back in about a week's time. He came out and he had a little bottle about that high, but he was an ounce or so in him. He said, all I could find. But he said, here's an address. He said, how long you be, where's the stopover? And I said, Montreal. Then we go from there to Alberta, and uh, Rocky Mountain House, Alberta. I guess we get off for that. But anyway, he said, here's an address. When you get into Montreal, get a taxi and take you to this, this pharmacy in Montreal and they'll have a bottle of brew for you. So I said, good. So I put that for water. So we got on the plane and stopped in Montreal. And got a, I got a taxi and another guy went with me, went into the drugstore and I walked in and I went over and found it, said, I told him who it was. And I said, I thought of Mr. Ross from Freddie and Drugstore, he's supposed to have orders in Boston proof. Or, yes, we have one. He had a bottle that high and not big around. And that's not stuff that's expensive. And I said, well, how much is that going to cost? He said, nothing. I said, nothing? No. He said, it's all paid, looked after for Mr. Ross in, Saint, in Freddie. Wow. He paid for the whole thing. I said, he's contributing to your, your, your race across Canada. Hmm. And I'm telling you, you wouldn't believe it. I don't know how many people I doctored about Boston Brew. What was it made from? Do you know what was balsam in it? Balsam I, I still have a I still have a little bottle in here. Wow. Smell like balsam. 
is black, sticky. Pitch, yeah. And it, I've seen guys come in, and they come in, and they'd have blisters. And some of the blisters would cover pretty well all the palm in their hand. And I always carried a little medical kit with me, a sharp knife and a fire, and a pair of pliers and different things like that for fishing. I always carried one. So I removed that skin and put that box in the pool and covered the hand with that box in the pool and take just a piece of gauze and wrap it lightly so it would breathe. Next morning the paddle, and they never, never wouldn't even bleed. It wouldn't bleed. And the, and the best one I liked about it, it, it never, it never formed a scab on the outside. It heals the inside out, leg in, and you never had a scab. Nothing, not a scab. Most time was some stuff you put on, and the scab would come on and start bleeding, and you have to heal it over again. This it didn't work it away. Wow. And people then, well, I didn't, I never took notice. Just before the race started, up there. I can down a little bit of a cold, and I didn't want to get any worse. So I had long jaw, not just the bottoms. So when the race started, I kept them on. Well, you, you, you're soaking wet every day, and you have blue jeans on, and the dye out of the blue jeans would get in, and you'd have a little scrape on your leg, or hair a little bad. First, you'd get infected from the dye of the jeans, and people had these boils on their rear end and stuff. And I fixed them up, put that balls and proof on. They just, <laughs> you wouldn't believe. You wouldn't believe. First thing happened our race. This uh, uh, David Laundry, he came down with hemorrhoids. He couldn't paddle, so I only left me one bowman. Henry and I took. I first started a uh, bow, and this, uh, Henry and I took turns in the in the, in the third, So I thought I left one bowman. Yeah, Google it. And then, the next thing happened, this Tom Pinkard, we were going from one racing spot to the other and bringing the tents and luggage and, and the big army truck. We ran this gravel road, muddy in the spring. He ran around this turn and the truck took us slow and he caught himself and he ran to his back and he couldn't pass. So I lost two, wait for the first thing. So the way it was set up, you paddle two days and then you don't one day. Because he had sea spares, he, he rotated. So we couldn't do that. So well, un, under 104 days, I saw the canoe five times. I had five days of 104, I saw it five times with the paddling. And not those five times, I was in the canoe, because we had a sprint race, and I never missed a sprint race. I was in all the sprint races. I was always in the canoe. <laughs> It was quite it was quite a thing, and and we got in that first race. That we started at the Rocky Mountain House, Alberta, and we had to race down the stream about 30 miles, and we come to a railroad bridge. All of our flats, I think it was called a place. I'm not sure. I have it all marked down my books or the name, and we did good. Then we had a sprint race. So none of the guys in my canoe were sprint racing. The guy in my bow was Jerry Dugwood, and he was about my height. I should have had someone in the bow that was Bill McKay, long arm. That would have made, still coming in fifth place, I would say, not exaggerating, I figured we'd come in waiting in the First, second, or third, no lower than third. Maybe take it the second or third will be on the bow. All of it in the world. Our first race, we started at the footbridge. You had to go down from the railroad bridge down to the car bridge. Our team was ahead. And we was ahead quite a ways. But you had to go around the button and come up the other side. Every canoe in the race that day, 10 canoes, all went down around the button and gone up. And we were still, still trying to turn the canoe. Guy didn't have a clue in order how to turn the canoe. Not one clue in order. Mm. And I, you take a back, you take six guys in a 25-foot canoe back in the stern, cannot turn that. No, no. Unless they, unless they have the other guy working with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you just can't do it. All that power, and they're all pulling straight down. Mm -hmm. Well, by that time we get turned, we were fired from that building over there, away from the railroad bridge. Wow. <laughs> Quebec come down here, they can go down, they around that, they, they can turn their canoe in the dime. Give you back the chain. Yeah. You know, that they thought it was training. Yeah. We was against professionals. We wasn't just they wasn't all professionals in the race. Now a lot of people get the idea. 
the only professional, the only amateur in that race was Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Northwest Territories, the Yukon. Hmm. That was the only four teams in that whole race was with amateurs. Quebec, they had guys that paddled the Olympics for run gold medals. Not <laughs> not six man canoes, but I mean they, Yeah. And, and and the guys from the West, Catchwater, Manitoba, they competed all summer long. Sponsored by some big uh, uh, meat company or something like that for racing these race and they won they made a living that racing these guys I mean they was they was professionals yeah yeah and we wow. ended up New Brunswick ended up beating we beat Quebec and we beat out Saskatchewan and and then not only a smaller team but we we was only Manitoba no, not Alberta we was only Ontario we was only an hour or so out and Manitoba uh, on Man, uh, Scat uh, Alberta and Manitoba, they came in first and BC sec and second, but we we reached it up there. But I'm telling you, I tell you, and I said all along, if I had that bill in that bow, my bow man, I know, I all the rest of the teams that come in first and second and third, they had long arms. Just snap that canoe, you wouldn't believe it. Maybe you fellas don't realize it. When we were racing, just in a, in a, a day's race, he did 60 strokes a minute. Wow. And not only that, I was in the stern, or second stern, and I did the calling. Every 15 strokes, I would say, ready, ha. Huh. So you went from one side to the other. And you did 15 strokes, and then ready, ha, huh, went back. And you said, change, not only do 60 strokes in the long race, but you, just, you had to change four times. Every 15 strokes, you hear just back and forth. And I'm telling you, and the only, and you didn't, he didn't look at the award. Oh, it's lunchtime. We'll go to the shore and have tea. Fifteen hours. You didn't eat. Then you couldn't eat it. And the sad part is, for me, I was in the stern, and all these other guys ahead of me they drank beer in the evening. They drank coffee or tea. They could go last maybe two or three hours and have a leak. So you didn't have a hose hook on and put it over the side. You wet your pants. So all this pissy water <laughs> in the group, all around back. And I'm back in the stern where of my feet in, in that water in the pissy water. I had to wash my feet and put everything I could think on, get the smell of them, and the nice pissy guy <laughs> drank a beer. <laughs> so I mean it wasn't an uphill pleasure trip, it was a high trip. 